first maximum likelihood estimation of the spatial probit and tobit. And just to set the stage, let's start by considering what happens in the classic probit model. So in the classic probit model, the um, observations are independent, so the likelihood is made up as a product of probabilities, the product of the probability that um, u of i or sub i is less than the appropriate bound, uh, which is a function of x and beta. And so we can write this as the product pi of i, pi sub i, from the integral from minus infinity to c sub i for the density of the standard normal. So that's basically uh, a complicated way of writing the cumulative uh, distribution evaluated at u uh, at uh, ci. And ci, um, again, to be able to use a single notation for both the observed 1 and observed 0 case, uh, which are only different uh, in terms of their sign, we set, we preface x sub i um, beta divided by sigma i by a new term that is 2 y sub i minus 1. So when y sub i is 1, the result is plus 1. So then we have the condition that uh, u sub i is less than x i beta over sigma i. And if y sub i is 0, then we have a negative. So then we have the condition that u sub i is less than negative x sub i beta divided by sigma i. And in the classic probit, we set the uh, variance equal to 1 for identification purposes. So this is a straightforward product of univariate standard normal probabilities. Okay. In contrast, in the spatial probit, we have to deal with the whole full joint distribution. And the reason for that is the dependence induced by the spatial autocorrelation. So instead of a nice product of univariate uh, densities, we have an evaluation of an n-dimensional multivariate normal density. So it, it cannot be emphasized enough what a difference this is, because in the standard case, we simply deal with univariate uh, densities, which is easy to do. In the spatial case, we're out of luck. We cannot do that anymore. So the full n-dimensional integral um, needs to be evaluated for all the bounds, the bound for each of the observations, and applied to a multivariate normal random variable with the variance covariance matrix induced by the spatial autoregressive process. So that's this uh, by now familiar i minus lambda w prime i minus lambda w, the whole thing inverted. So this is no longer a product of univariate densities and it requires explicit multidimensional integration. Now, um, you may not fully appreciate what this means, but up till recently, it was impossible, even numerically, uh, to evaluate a multidimensional uh, integral of a multivariate distribution for more than a handful of dimensions, uh, like less than 10. So if you have even something like the US counties, you have a 3,000 dimensional multivariate distribution. In, in essence, there is no way you can evaluate this uh, multi-dimensional integral. You just can't do it. So keep that in mind as we proceed because in essence it means there is not going to be an analytical solution. We'll have to approach this by computational means. Now to set the stage for the two spatial models, let's re-express this in terms of a series of marginal conditions for the um, error terms at each observation. And here we're going to do something uh, slightly different. And this comes out of the Baron and Weiverberg papers, where instead of the usual 2y sub i minus 1, they use the, the reverse, 1 minus 
to Y sub I. And um, the reverse is done because they stick to the original um, inequality condition and they um, set the inverse sign um, as it was in the original expression. Remember before we used symmetry to flip the signs, um, we basically have that from the x beta plus u less than uh, greater than zero condition, we have that minus u is less than um, x i beta for y sub i equal one. And then for y sub i equals zero, we have the reverse, that u sub i is less than negative x i beta. So with this new um, transformation, this new kind of variable, 1 minus 2 y sub i, we can set the inequality condition for all cases as v sub i, which is either minus u sub i for i, I equal 1 and u sub i for i equals 0, v sub i is less than minus 1 minus 2 y sub i x sub i beta. And so again, this is going to be less than x beta for y equal 1 and less than minus x beta, negative x beta for y equals 0. So these are the standard conditions. And now we're going to write this in matrix form because we want to show the difference between this case and the spatial cases. And we want to move to the log likelihood. So if we take all these 1 minus 2 y sub i terms and put them in the diagonal of a matrix, an n by n diagonal matrix, then we can write this whole thing in matrix form as the probability that a vector of random variables v, that's an n-dimensional vector, one for each observation, is less than a vector that is obtained by taking the product of negative this diagonal matrix z, because it's di diagonal, it only multiplies each element in the vector x beta by the proper 1 minus 2 y sub i, so that's just kind of a fancy notation to do something very simple. So we have this inequality between these two vectors. And these are both n by 1 vectors, n-dimensional vectors. So the log likelihood, just like we did in this maximum likelihood for the spatial models, we don't write it as a product, but we write it as the log likelihood of the whole multivariate distribution. So in the notation of Baron and Weiferberg, the log of the li likelihood is the log of a um, m using a multivariate standard normal density with um, the bounds are minus z x beta, the mean is zero, and the variance covariance matrix is an identity matrix i. So it's evaluated at uh, negative z x beta. So for the spatial lag model, there are two changes. First of all, we no longer have x beta, but we have from the reduced form, i minus rho w inverse x beta. And in their notation, we uh, write this as gamma sub rho x beta. So again, this is a matrix times a vector, so it, it turns out to be a vector just like before only it's a little more complicated now, and it contains the parameter rho. That's why we have gamma sub rho. And then for the error term, same thing. We also have this inverse transformation, i minus rho w inverse times the error term, and we write this as gamma sub rho, the error term, because the variance is a function of the rho parameter in the spatial order regression and the variance is the familiar matrix inverse that we've seen many times before. I minus rho w prime, I minus rho w. So the marginal conditions then are very similar to the ones we had for the classic probit. We again have v, which is this um, either um, negative u of i or uh, positive u sub i, less than negative the z again, the 
diagonal matrix with the 1 minus 2 y sub i on the diagonal, the gamma transform, uh, the, the inverse matrix x beta. So the full log likelihood then for the multivariate normal distribution has bounds minus z gamma rho x beta. The mean is zero as before and the variance covariance matrix is the one we have above with the inverse term. <clears throat> Spatial error probe it slightly different because we no longer have the reduced form. So the bounds are z x beta as before and the variance covariance matrix is the only distinguishing aspect here. So uh, again we set uh, we use the same notation as before and the error term becomes gamma sub lambda now because we use lambda as the parameter in the error model and then the variance covariance matrix is the familiar form. The, the marginal conditions then are again uh, V either negative sub i or sub i less than negative z x beta just as in the classic probit model no need for the inverse transformation on the x beta and the log likelihood is again a multivariate normal density evaluated at negative z x beta the mean is zero and the variance covariance matrix is the expression above with the inverse. So the problem with maximum likelihood is that we need to evaluate this multi-dimensional um, integral for the multivariate normal distribution. So the idea of the simulation estimator that Baron and Viverberg uh, introduced is that we're going to transform this multivariate normal distribution into a series, a product of univariate distributions. Univariate distributions because we're going to transform the dependent V sub i's, the dependent random variables, normal random variables, into independent random variables by a transformation. And so after that transformation, we're back in business and can treat each of these as a univariate distribution, which is easy to sample from. And because we can't do it analytically, we use a simulation estimator. So in essence, what that boils down to is that we compute each of these marginal probabilities and then multiply them together to get a joint probability for the joint multivariate distribution and the log of that is, is used in a log likelihood, log likelihood function. So uh, we do this many times, r times, because it's simulation, and then we take the average over these r times of these um, log likelihoods that we have computed <coughs> for each of the draws. So two important principles. One is that we transform the dependent random variable into a series of independent univariate random variables. The second one is that we simulate the joint probability. We simulate a joint probability and then use the average of many simulations as a value in a numerical optimization routine that maximizes for the parameters. So how does this work? First, the uh, transformation. So we're going to use something called the Koleski decomposition, which is a decomposition of a square matrix into two triangular matrix matrices, uh, a lower triangular and an upper triangular. And actually, they're the same. So this usually is expressed as A prime A, where A is the upper triangular one and a prime is its transpose, which is a lower triangular one. So the product of these two triangular matrices is the full matrix. So what we use this for is to decompose the inverse of the variance matrix. And um, we'll see in a second, or let me show you why that is. Because if you remember, the variance matrices omega, 
is actually the inverse of a ma matrix, right? The inverse of that matrix is an analytical expression. It's identity matrix minus lambda w plus w prime plus lambda squared w prime w. So that's easy to write, much easier than the inverse term. So we decompose that analytical expression, uh, which is a square matrix, and get the Kolesky decomposition. And one of the reasons why we deal with that rather than with the original variance and then invert it is because the inverse of a triangular matrix is a very easy thing. It's much easier than a full matrix. So we avoid the um, n by n matrix inversion um, uh, problem. So to, to make this concrete, if V is the vector, and it's a multivariate random a variable, so it's a vector of n observations that has a variance covariance matrix omega, and we decompose um, omega inverse as a prime a, then if we pre-multiply v by a, we get a standard normal variant. The, um, you can see this because the, the variance of um, the variance of um, eta, eta um, is um, a variance of v times a prime, and the um, the a prime a is the inverse of the variance. So a prime a is the variance. So these two cancel out, and we get the um, standard normal distribution. So, uh, but the eta variable as such is not uh, useful to us. We we need to have v, so we get v back by pre-multiplying eta by a inverse. Now, you might say, why go through this uh, complicated transformation and then get back to something that we multiply pre-multiply by a triangular matrix? Well, the reason for that is, is that now eta is standard normal. And um, the b, b eta is a, a system of equations, in, of inequalities actually, not equations, of inequalities with a particular triangular form. And we can actually solve that easily, recursively, recursively from going from the bottom to the top. So um, what are we doing here? We are getting rid of the problem that these Vs are all um, co-determined. They have a multivariate distribution. So we uh, replace, we express the Vs. We don't replace the Vs. We express them differently. We, replace, we express them as a product of a matrix of constants these constants, we can treat them as constants, but actually they involve the spatial parameter because they come from the omega inverse, which has a spatial parameter in there. But for our purposes, we can treat them as constants, so we know them. So we can solve this inequality, and then each of these etas can be treated as a univariate random variable. So we can compute its cumulative uh, distribution, just like we did in the standard probit with our phi of x beta, we can do that for each of these and then multiply all these probabilities together to get the joint likelihood and the log of that is the log likelihood. So let me show you how this actually works. It's a little bit complex, but once you see the structure, it's actually amazingly straightforward. So um, the top uh, graph gives you the vector inequality, right? So the vector inequality uh, gives, um, they, they change the notation a little bit, so the V on the, uh, this is actually not from the braun Weiverberg paper, it's from another paper uh, by uh, Francese, and uh, the other name escapes me, but uh, which is a very nice description of this actually, it's one of the readings. So in our notation this is capital V, it's a little bit confusing possibly, 
So beta times eta less than the bound. So the bounds are um, the, uh, the x betas. So these are the bounds, right? And uh, the bounds are in the notation of Baron Weiverberg, the minus z, and for the lag model, the gamma sub rho times x beta. Those are the, the, the right-hand side terms of the inequality. So the eta's, eta 1 through eta n, are the um, independent standard normal random variables. They each have a univariate distribution. Now, the whole thing, of course, has a multivariate distribution, but it has a particular shape of this triangular matrix that multiplies these. Now, the interesting thing is that at the bottom of the matrix, we have Bnn times eta n is less than Vn. Okay, and that is um, can be solved, as you see on the bottom graph, as eta n is less than Bnn inverse, 1 over Bnn. Bnn is a scalar. This is not a matrix inverse. So it's basically the original bound, um, the minus z x beta for n divided by b and n. So that's a number, and we can evaluate the probability that a to n is less than that value. That's in the same way as we do with the cumulative normal distribution in the probit model. We have a value for xi beta. We evaluate that. We stick it in the cumulative normal, standard normal uh, distribution, and we get a probability value, a p-value. So that's the p-value for the last one. Then we move up one row, and if we look carefully, we see that um, the row above only involves two terms, the term in eta n minus 1 and the term in eta n. And with a value for eta n in hand, which we only can do because we simulate it, then we can actually solve that next row. So we now um, simulate an eta n from a truncated normal distribution with a truncation at uh, vn divided by bnn. So we can do that too. So then eta is a properly truncated random normal variable, uh, and we stick it in this equation, which now includes v sub n minus 1, which we know, that's the z x beta for n minus 1, the two b terms, the b n minus 1 n, and the inverse of b n minus 1 n minus 1 from the diagonal term, we know those, those are constant, and then the a to n, which we just drew a value from for from the truncated distribution. So again, this gives us a value, a scalar, we can evaluate the probability that eta n sub n minus 1 is less than this bound in the usual way with the cumulative standard normal distribution. That gives us a p-value, the second p-value in our series of independent p-values for our joint um, distribution. right? And then again, uh, we have the bound for a to n minus 1, so we draw a truncated, a, standard, a truncated standard normal variate from that, which gives us a value for a to n minus 1 for the next expression. And the one row up depends on three a's, but we have them from the draws. So we can again compute the bound, evaluate the probability, and then draw a new truncated variable, and so work our way up all the way to the top of the matrix. So to summarize this, the RIS sampler, and there's some technical aspects to the sampling that I won't uh, delve into. The reason why it's called a recursive important sampler is a particular way of uh, drawing the random variables, but we, we won't get into this. So basically, the, the key is that we work the inequalities from the bottom up. So our goal to keep in mind, there's really two things going on here. One is that we need to evaluate these univariate probabilities. And we do that with just a standard cumulative standard normal. 
as long as we have the bounds, the, the Z X beta bounds. But these are, are going to be a little bit more complicated because they include these eta terms. So the the first thing, the the first concept is to evaluate the univariate probability for which you need a bound. And the second thing is to get these eta variables, values for those, and we get those by simulating them, by drawing them from a truncated normal distribution. The truncation bound is the same bound that we used to compute the probability. So there's the bounds are used for two things. One, to compute the probability, and second, to draw a random eta term, which we then plug into the solution of the next one, row up, we get a new bound, we assess the probability, we draw a truncated random variable, that one goes into the row above, again the bound, probability, and so on. So we work our way up from the bottom to the top of the triangle, so to speak, and then we have n univariate p-values, one for each observation, we multiply these together and we have the joint probability. Uh, actually, typically you don't multiply them together because they're all very small values, so they, you have uh, rounding errors in the computer, so you take the logs and you add them together. But that's, that's the, joint, the log likelihood of the joint distribution. So then um, you do this again, and that gives you another set of univariate p-values, which you multiply together to get the joint probability, so then you have two. You do this a total of r times, and you take the average of all these joint probabilities, and that is the value that you plug into the uh, optimization routine. To get the next iteration, which then gets you a new set of parameter values, and you repeat the whole process. So the simulated log likelihood approach runs R simulations, and R is typically like a thousand or even more. Uh, for each simulation, you compute this product of probabilities for the univariate standard normals, evaluated at, at the right bounds, which you have to compute. You get the joint likelihood. You use this in an optimization routine, and you're good to go. Now, this tends to be very slow because for each new value of lambda, the the variance covariance matrix changes, and of course its inverse changes as well, and you have to do the Koleski decomposition all over again to get your new Bs in the triangular um, matrix, and then you solve this whole process again. So this tends to be very slow. The, uh, there is no analytical asymptotic variance covariance matrix, but uh, typically the numerical optimization routine that you use um, will give that you to you automatically as the Hessian, the, the second partial derivatives used in the optimization routine. So that's the maximum likelihood estimation. Now the Bayesian estimation, as um, outlined in a paper by Jim LeSage, um, is similar in spirit to the EM approach that we discussed previously. So the EM approach was expectation maximization. Um, it uh, mimicked, in the maximization routine, it, it used a latent variable that we, um, as if it was a real observation that we got from the expected value in the conditional distribution. Now in the Bayesian approach, we'll do something similar and we'll get a, a distribution for the latent variable. Um, from the truncated normal based on whether um, the y sub i is a 1 or is a 0. So if, it, if it's a 1, it's truncated uh, to the left because we, we know that the latent variable is larger than 0, so we need to evaluate it in a properly truncated distribution that is larger than 0. And if y sub i is 0, we need to truncate on the right because we know that um, y star has to be negative, and this then is used in a sampling routine. So, uh, and it's a little outside the scope of this particular uh, set of slides to get into depth on the Bayesian approach, but basically the, uh, the estimation is by simulation, where you set 
up a set of conditional distributions for the parameters, you draw values for the parameters from, from these distributions, and you keep doing this until it uh, stabilizes and until the, um, the draws uh, are stable and then they reflect the uh, they are as if they are draws from the joint posterior distribution for all the parameters. And uh, basically what this boils down to is setting up the proper conditionals and then carrying out a simulation estimation routine by drawing the parameters and iterating and, and keep going. It's basically the same for probate and tobit except for the uh, truncation condition. So for the probit, it's a simple um, for y is 1, it's to the left, y is 0, it's to the right. In um, the, pro the tobit, uh, it will be for y observed versus y unobserved. So that's a little more complicated. Um, the key step in this is the conditional distribution for the um, unobserved latent variable. And we will condition on the observed y of i and the values for all the parameters. And in Lesage's work, this is um, proposed as a, a normal distribution where the mean is basically the z, the z uh, not the z, the gamma sub rho x beta um, from, uh, for the lag model. So the uh, proper value from the i minus rho w inverse x beta vector, and in the error model is just x beta. That's the difference between the two. But then both of them, the, um, the variance of this um, is obtained from the rho elements and the inverse of i minus rho w. And right there, you see there's going to be a computational issue because we need to do this uh, inverse each time. And then the truncation is, as I mentioned, to the left for y equal 1 and to the right for y equal 0. So this allows us to draw um, values for the latent dependent variable and then treat them as if they are observed. So we do not, unlike the approach in Baron and Viverberg, where we actually work with the um, joint likelihood, the multivariate joint likelihood for the probit model as is. In, in the Bayesian approach by Lesage, we work with the likelihood from, and, the, and actually the joint distributions from the standard continuous dependent variable lag and error models, very much in the same spirit as the EM approach. So then this gets very technical, and, and I said uh, this is really outside the scope of this particular um, slide, but I want to uh, give you a sense of this. So uh, in essence, it is exactly the same approach as Lesage has outlined for the simultaneous autoregressive models, the lag and the error models. They have diffuse priors for all the parameters, meaning there is not a lot of prior information built in. It lets the data speak for themselves. Um, for sigma, this prior is a chi-squared distribution, so you can draw from this chi-squared distribution to um, get a value for sigma. Uh, this is uh, constructed by using the residuals that you get from the lag uh, and the error models from the maximum likelihood expectation, just as if you were doing a standard spatial regression. The beta is a multivariate normal with the expressions that we get from the lag and error uh, estimation, uh, specification, I must say. And then basically they are the least squares expression where we treat, uh, uh, weighted least squares expression where we treat low, rho or lambda as known. And then for rho, it's a non-standard solution because it has this um, it's not an actual distribution, it's proportional to an expression in the residuals and the determinant of the Jacobian, the same Jacobian that we've seen in maximum likelihood estimation of the lag and error model. So this is all a little bit uh, obscure maybe, but 
Uh, it's way too technical to get into detail. I just want to give you a sense uh, of how this works. So you get these conditionals, and then you can um, you can sample and and the the just like we had these um, concentrated likelihood in the maximum likelihood estimation, we'll use a similar way of thinking where we can, uh, given a value for rho, we can find the solutions for sigma and beta, but um, the rho solution is actually a little more complicated. So in the um, Bayesian setup, um, we can apply, because we have full conditionals for beta and sigma squared, we can apply um, the Gibbs sampling, which is a standard result, but for rho we don't have the full conditionals, and so then we have to use Metropolis Hastings, which is a sort of rejection sampling that we use for non-standard densities, and it basically uses a, a distribution that is close to the required distribution and has some kind of rejection criterion. So, um, as I said, this is a whole field in its own right. I just want to give you a sense of some of the jargon and some of the terminology involved. Inference, as in all Bayesian uh, inference, is based on the posterior distributions, which we construct by sampling. So we sample from these conditional distributions, and if we do it long enough, this is Markov chain Monte Carlo, the chain converges, and then we can take values from this chain and that gives us a nice posterior distribution for which we can get the mean or the median, the standard deviation, and all kinds of confidence intervals that we want. So <clears throat> I know it's a lot of material, it's very technical, but I wanted to give you a sense of what's involved in moving from the continuous dependent variable world to the discrete dependent variable world, and it's specifically the binary dependent variables.